So we're going to have a bit of a canter through today, all of the um, aspects around your your sort of carbon reduction within your own operations. Um, and um, I know we've got a mix of different experience levels and sort of starting points. So do please um, put things in the chat um, if, if you've got any questions as we go, um, or if, if I'm completely lo losing you, do just interrupt. Um, I think Alex is going to try and keep an eye on the chat and on the hands that go up. So if I if I miss it, she can nudge me, uh, and and we'll we'll sort of try and cover things as we go. Um, so this is really part of a sort of wider piece around the the role of museums in in sort of helping move towards a more sustainable future. Um, and because of course, in fact some of the most powerful things you can do are around um, raising awareness and, and supporting others in their own um, sort of journeys. But today is very much about your own operations. So um, we'll, we will be um, focusing entirely on just that one bit today. And then within this, um, this program, there's some other um, sessions that may be relevant to you, um, covering other aspects of, of sort of the, the role of museums. So it is going to be a bit left brained, I'm afraid. Um, so brace yourselves. There's going to be some numbers. Um, but if I get too technical uh, and it's just sort of um, leaving you uh, cold, then then stick your hand up and we'll try and make sure that we keep it relevant and useful to you. So before we sort of launch into the specifics, um, what I'd like to do is just sort of get you to have a little think about um, where the management of your organization is is centered and the and the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis and for most of us the, the dominant decision making thing is can we afford it have we got the money is it in the budget um, and that that drives a lot of the decision making that we're taking and if you, in, in terms of how you make sure that you're on budget um, you, you probably have some sort of process to keep an eye on that on a fairly regular basis. Um, I think it would be quite unusual for an organization to run its finances on the basis of waiting until the end of the year, seeing what's left in the pot, and then sort of 18 months later deciding whether it went well or not. Um, that, that, that would be a fairly inefficient way of trying to uh, uh, manage your finances, I think. And in terms of decision making on what spend you can afford, um, often in organisations there's a there's a there's a hierarchy of authority that that you know it's not up to everybody just to spend whatever they want. They have to get approvals. There has to be checked against the budgets. Um, and if you overspend, there's the consequences. So in all of that most organizations spend really quite a lot of time thinking about how much they've got what they're spending forecasting future budgets thinking about what they can afford making difficult decisions about what to spend money on and what not to spend money on and that's that's really quite a, quite a major part of the role of most people managing any organization really so if you then think about your carbon emissions in relation to that, how much time do you spend thinking about what your carbon emissions were over the last month or year? And when you're making a decision about buying something or, or I mean, traveling somewhere, for example, do you think about what the carbon impact of that as well as what the financial cost is? And do you think, well, can we actually afford to be using up that carbon? Where does that fit against our targets of reducing our carbon and our budget? for reducing our carbon and this is this is something that's going on um I mean, it's going on right across the business sector there's a whole new breed of people whose job it is to do carbon accounting and to try and embed decision making in organizations to think about carbon impact alongside um the, the financial impact because until you start to manage your carbon emissions then any form of target setting or any form of goals you want to set about your, your future carbon emissions 
are not really connected to the actions you're taking today. So, so that's just a little sort of thing to start thinking about uh, at the beginning of this session. A lot of what we're talking about here is is a bit akin to start to think about your finances and the way in which you count your money and track it and and uh, and manage it and make decisions to stay within budget all the same things are going to apply to the way that we um work uh, around carbon so so that's just a bit of background um what we're going to do today is two sessions um we'll we'll the first session will take us through till probably just a, bit, a little bit after 11. Um, then we'll take a five minute break because I'll certainly need a coffee by then. And then we'll launch into the second half. And broadly speaking, the session is divided into the first half is about all the things to do with measuring, tracking and the things you want to track. Um, and if you get really excited about it, then there's another session later in the program all about the way in which you can track carbon and what tools you can use to do that which is a bit more of a deep dive into the into the tools. Today, we'll be thinking about what you want to, to track and why. And then the second half of the session is about what you can, you know, what are the things you can, what tools have you got? What levers can you pull to actually affect the outcome uh, and and the things that you can, you can start to implement, practically speaking, um, from, from the relatively simple through to the more involved. So that's what we're going to be talking through. Um, I'll pause for questions at the end of the first session, and then there should be some time for questions at the end. Um, but if you've got a burning issue that you want to raise, then raise your hand or put it in the chat, uh, and, and Alex will, will, will try and draw my attention to it somehow, probably by gesticulating wildly or interrupting me. So some basic principles. Um, it, it, and, 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 and it shouldn't get too scary, but what we're actually looking to do is to think about a sort of a cycle that we're working through where we're going to measure what's happening we're going to decide which things are important look at the things that might help us with that which may involve actually coming up with some new ideas um, we're going to do some numbers make a plan and then importantly we're going to monitor whether we're working to plan whether it's actually working so we're back to measure again and and that cycle is something that we need to be doing probably on a sort of annual cycle basis um, some people do like a five-year plan um, so for example the, the the a lot of the councils have now got these rolling five-year plans um, i think the problem with five-year plans is it takes longer to prepare them they end up being delivered late and they get to about year four before they really start thinking about what to do um, and so there is a move to try and move to a more frequent uh, frequent uh, running around the cycle so we're going to talk quite a bit about measuring today. And as I say, there's another session that goes very, very much more deeply into that. Um, it's very important to prioritize and spend your time and effort, which is very limited, on the things that are going to make the biggest difference. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, looking into all the options, there is a, there's a real um, tendency that I see repeatedly coming up where people have decided that what they need is a heat pump for example, and then they're going out and saying, well, what, what, what heat pump can we have? They haven't actually sat down and thought through if that's the best use of their resources and money. Maybe there's other things they could be doing. You know, rather than jumping to it to a conclusion, you do need to spend the time to actually explore what, what are the best options. And I mean, even if we just think of the people on this session today, you've each of you got some very different challenges. Um, I mean, the, the, the country in the Eastern U, um, building is a lovely building, but it's got some very specific re, uh, challenges of its own uh, around this area. So although it's good to look at what others are doing, you need to think very carefully about the specifics of your own situation, because um, it, it may well be that you're trying to solve a problem that's different from a solution that worked for somebody else. Um, I'm afraid you do need to do some, some maths. Um, it, it's something that comes up very often in, in the sort of area I work in that about you know, people say things like, well, what's the point in us doing anything because of China? Um, well, you need to think of the world as being a bit like the camel with all the straw on its back. 
the fact that someone else is putting straw on doesn't doesn't make any difference that your straws that you put on are continuing to add to the burden on the beast. Um, so it is a genuinely a case where everything you can contribute does actually make a, a difference to the to the pile that we're creating of the problem. Um, we need to plan, and as I was talked about before, we want to be able to make a plan and, and implement it, uh, and then we want to monitor it and, and track progress, and if things aren't working, change direction and so on. Um, and this cycle of, of sort of measuring, analyzing, and acting is a sort of a continuous thing that we need to start to get into the habit of, exactly as we do already when it comes to, 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 to money and budgets and so on. So taking the slightly out of order, just starting with prioritize, because this is this is a really important one, I think. And it's frustrating that you see so many initiatives um, that use up a whole chunk of, of sort of goodwill and, and enthusiasm that are actually directed towards things that don't really make a great deal of difference to the outcome. Um, and in terms of that, we're not it's not so much don't sweat the small stuff, because actually, as I've said, everything counts. But what you want to do is don't let that small stuff distract you. You don't really want to be um, sidelined into spending a lot of time and effort on, on an initiative because somebody's hobby horse or someone came up with it. And then actually you find that the outcome hasn't really delivered a great deal. Um, and, and we see it all the time. And, and within your organizations, you have teams of a lot, probably quite a few volunteers and so on you have a limited resource available to you in terms of people's energy and enthusiasm and, and goodwill. And so what where, where you're using that up to help with this, you really want to make sure that you're using it on the stuff that's going to make the maximum impact and difference. So let's dive into some of the, the sort of techie detail a bit on this. When we're talking about carbon emissions, we use the term carbon emissions as a sort of a shorthand for all the greenhouse gases in the form of their sort of equivalent carbon dioxide amount. Um, so um, within that, we're, we're sort of trying to then think about a number we can use that gives a broad equivalency across everything. So if, for example, you're talking about a gas boiler, then you're emitting some a good chunk of CO2, but you're also emitting some unburnt methane. And we, need, we want to be able to use one, use one number. So we, we just conglomerate that into carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, net zero, um, again, this is a term that gets banded around a lot. Um, if you go back five years, you'd find quite a lot of people were talking about carbon neutral. And carbon neutral has has sort of been moved to one side because it was it was a it was a sort of a measure that enabled big organisations to offset their pollution by doing stuff that may or may not have done any good um, and using carbon offsets and it became um, a, a sort of a cause of of a lot of of um, greenwashing really um, so. Over the last sort of 10 years or so, the international standard has been very rapidly developed, actually, for net zero as a, as a metric. And it, there is a, there's a whole lot of, of, of um, paperwork you can, you can dive into that will go into all the detail about the specifics of that standard, like any form of sort of international standard. It's very wordy, but it's very specific and quite legalistic. But fundamentally, what it's saying is you draw a box around your organization, um, which if you're just running one museum is relatively easy to do. Um, if, if you're a large conglomerate multinational, it gets a bit more tricky. And what you're aiming to do is to have no net carbon coming out of that box. That's where you get to net zero. You can use some offsetting, ideally use offsetting with, under your own control. So rather than paying some money to somebody to say they planted a forest in Nicaragua, you would be doing something directly which you're under control of. Um, and within that, there are what they call these three scopes of emissions. And 
we'll be focusing on 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 thinking about these in your organization's terms. So scope one, this is effectively emissions that come out of your own facility. So it's carbon dioxide that's being churned out by your own facility, which um, typically will be, you know, if you've got a gas boiler or an oil boiler, or if you've got a car or a van that you own that you run, that's emissions that are directly coming out of your organization. Um, there are also, as I mentioned before, some fugitive emissions. Um, so, for example, if you use a gas hob, um, something like 1.3% of the gas comes out unburnt as methane, and that's more than 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions of a gas hob. So when you're using a gas hob, it's not just the, the, the direct carbon dioxide you're producing, you're, you're also emitting methane. So that's, that's the thing to think about. Um, but within that, um, the typical things would be looking at your gas bills, looking at your, uh, at your um, um, fuel bills if you run any vehicles. When, when you use gas, just so that you're aware of that, um, obviously directly there's some methane emissions, but also the gas you are burning has come all the way from, in our case, the North Sea. And along the way, there's been some methane emissions and things. And so there's a slight blurring of the lines there because when you use the standard numbers for converting a kilowatt hour of gas into carbon dioxide equivalent, actually that includes all of the upstream emissions and so on. They build all that in. So that it's, strictly speaking, you could argue that's that's not really scope one. It's really, it's scope two, because scope two is indirect emissions. This is energy you use on site, but where the emissions are somewhere else, which is basically electricity. Practically speaking for everybody, that's just your electricity. I mean, there are some some peculiarities. So, um, you know, if you're on a heat network, for example, that that might be scope two. But and scope one and two, those are the easy ones to measure because basically, you look at your bills. You do a very simple sum, and you can work out what your emissions have been. And for a lot of organisations, this is the things that they were doing and focusing on. And a lot, you know, even if you go back ten years, a lot of organisations were, were, were reporting on their scope one and two emissions. The problem with this, of course, is that these are the things that are directly inside your organization. And it's very easy to avoid responsibility for some of those simply by um, you know, getting, getting somebody else to do stuff for you. And there was a lot of um, toing and froing and debate probably 10, 10 plus years ago now in terms of the standards of what you count towards your emissions in order to, um, sorry, Alex, is there, is there someone in the, in the lobby waiting to come in? I think Matthew's. I don't know. Can I admit him? Let's sort of try pressing that button and see if that uh, lets I can't Matthew get in. To it, yeah. Could you, could you admit him? Thank you. I've tried pressing the button. I don't know if I have, if I have the authority. He hasn't appeared on my on my screen, but um, but it looked like he was trying to get in. So so there was a lot of discussion about this, and the decision was taken that what we needed was a thing called Scope Three. And scope three is very, very broad. Basically, it's the emissions that are caused by all the things that you buy and all the things that you do and sell. Um, so if, for example, you're Exxon, then you'll notice that they've made a commitment to be to achieve net zero within their own operations, um, which is basically not achieving net zero because it means that they're going to achieve net zero for the things that they do themselves, but take no responsibility for the emissions from all the oil they produce. So it doesn't actually comply with the international standard on the meaning of net zero. And there's there's various challenges going on in the way they've been presenting that because it's 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 uh, unsurprisingly they're trying to uh, slightly gloss over some of the some of their responsibilities. But in your case, what this really means is the things that you buy. Um, you need to think about what embodied greenhouse gases there are in those. And I mean, one of the things that includes, for example, is the the travel of people coming to visit your museum. Um, 
And that's quite a hard thing to nail down. And this is where it gets much, much more complicated to try and track and measure scope three, um, which is why a lot of organizations have just focused on one and two initially. And scope three will become easier. So in terms of the things that you buy, as this is taking hold across the, the, the world, across organizations, it's becoming more and more normal for consumer goods to actually say what their embodied carbon footprint is. And, and if you're a very big organization and the legislation is tightening on you to report your scope three, what you're doing, of course, is you're then saying to people that supply you, you need to tell me what the emissions are embodied in this thing I'm buying from you because I've got a duty to report it under my legal obligations under the new rules. And so this is driving this down through the supply chain, as we would call it, and more and more people are going to need to be able to say, when, you, when they supply you with something, a little on, on the thing, you know, it costs, you know, whatever it is, 42 quid, and it contains, you know, 336 grams of embodied carbon. And then at the other side of that, when you dispose of things, again, there's an impact of that, and you need to be thinking about the, the impact on disposal. So scope three is, is, is tricky. We're going to focus mostly for now on scope one and two, but it's worth thinking about some of the things that you can influence and things things like saying to visitors, how did you get here? And, and encouraging them to use public transport by advertising the public transport options. Um, things like that are all part of, of actions you can take on your scope three. As I say, we'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, there's a link there if you want to, to dive into the detail, um, but uh, that's for the enthusiastic only. So coming back to priorities, um, it's going to be very different depending on your organisation. Um, if you know, this is looking at, at two very different types of organisation. If you're a, a manufacturer, then actually purchase of goods is going to be a major part of what you do, and things like freight and and the use of those products might might be a chunk of it as well. Whereas for a school, it's mostly just lighting and heating the building. Um, there's a bit about travel. For, for, for the way that people get to school and the way that staff get to school and so on. But the priorities will be very different. Um, so really we want to, to, to make an assessment. Um, so the typical thing will be, you know, an organization have gone to huge efforts to reduce their paper use and recycling, but they'll still have the thermostat turned up to 25 degrees and the windows open. Um, and and you've, got to, you've got to really got to focus in on where, where are the, um, the emissions actually happening and where are the things that you can influence. So that brings us back, coming back to our cycle. The first thing on the cycle was measuring. Um, we need to measure things, obviously, as, as a, giving you the analogy with, with finance. If we don't know where we are, then it's very hard to, to, to make the correct decisions. We want to focus, as I've said before. We want to see the effect of what we do. So actually measuring today and then measuring tomorrow and seeing if the things we've done have made a difference is quite important. Um, we might want to know that the things we've done have been effective or not been effective, but even if they've been effective, it's nice to know that it's worked and it's nice to tell people and encourage them. Um, that little graphic there, that's a, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen some of these, they did some research on, on these sort of speed camera, you know, little speed signs that flash up. And they found that if it flashed up with an angry face, if you were over the speed limit or a happy face, if you were under, that was many times more effective than if it just told you what your speed was and flashed at you. You know, we're, we're hardwired to feel uncomfortable if someone's looking unhappily at us and more comfortable if they're looking happily at us. But uh, but yeah, so so feeding back um, is important. Um, and, and and sustaining that progress. One of the other thing about it is you want, what you want to do is to be able to see that each period you're making an improvement on the previous one. Um, Sometimes it, 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 it's a bit akin to sort of um, if you're trying to lose weight, you know, you, you need to be able to continue the process and and continue to to, to make progress downwards. Um, and and I, I like to remind people about the you know the, the Peter Drucker's thing about what gets measured gets managed. Um, the thing about that is that that's very often misquoted. People tend to quote it on the basis of what gets measured gets married, managed. That's a good thing. Whereas actually what Peter Drucker was, the point he was trying to make was, 
what gets measured gets managed. So you need to be really careful about what you measure. Because if you're measuring the wrong things, you'll be managing the wrong things and you won't get the out outcomes that you like. And this is this is particularly true in this space. You want to make sure that you're measuring the stuff that matters and put your effort and, and, and hard work into, into improving on those. So coming back to our scopes, um, I think for all of you that are here, the thing that's going to be the main thing is going to be to um, focus really in on scopes one and two. But there are a few things in scope three that might be worth putting some effort into. Um, and, and you'll need to just have a quick assessment and try and, again, think about priorities, think about focusing on, on the things that are going to make a difference. So for measuring, we're talking about initially for scope one and two, your electricity bill and your heating bill, your, whether it's gas or oil or whatever you're on. So we'll just, just sort of think, have a little bit of think about those and how those work in terms of what that means into uh, relating those information on your bill in terms of kilowatt hours with carbon emitted. And you may well find, um, if you if you look at your bills, certainly on my electricity and gas bill, it tells me what the carbon is. Um, and even on my smart meter, if I can press a button and it'll tell me what the carbon is, as well as what the cost is, as well as what the consumption is. Um, so so that it's, it's relatively straightforward to access this information. And all of these things are in kilowatt hours. Um, and, and being an engineering type, I get very sort of picky about units. Um, it's the sort of it's it's my equivalent of of, of uh, curators being picky about putting the um, the, the origins of the, any any artifact on the labels. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're using the right units, and it's a kilowatt hour. And the reason it's a kilowatt hour is it's it's energy we're talking about here. We're talking about how much work has been done. Um, a kilowatt is a unit of power. That's how hard you're working, not how much you've got done. Kilowatt hour is how much you've got done. So it's the equivalent of having one kilowatt working for one hour. Uh, and it's what we now measure electricity and gas in typically. Um, and for each of those, we can convert quite quickly and easily from a kilowatt hour to what the equivalent um, uh, carbon emissions are. And for 2022, the government publishes these figures of what they want people to use. And for 2022, they've said that mains gas is 182 grams per kilowatt hour. That really doesn't change much because gas is gas. Um, it has changed slightly because they did a slight reassessment of some of the um, emissions associated with getting the gas out of the ground and through the pipes to, to your building. Um, mains electricity for 2022, they're using 193 grams per kilowatt hour. Um, but actually, mains is, electricity is much more complicated because it varies all the time depending on what mix of generation is going on to the grid. Um, so, so we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but if you're looking historically at last year's numbers, those are the, the right numbers to use just to assess the, the carbon impact. Um, if you're thinking about how you're going to monitor this on an ongoing basis, um, if you have a smart meter, it's, it's dead easy because it, the, the data is just there and available to you. If you're a larger user of electricity, you'll be already on half hourly metering and your energy supplier um, can provide you with half hourly data that will tell you how much you've used every half hour for electricity. Um, gas, you may find you've only got monthly data if you're on an older meter or whenever it was read. And actually, the other thing you'll, you'll, you may find, which is the bane of my life, is you ask people for their gas consumption, you get a set of data, and it, it says they've used exactly the same amount of gas every quarter for the last three years. And, and you say, well, when did you actually last have your meter read? And then suddenly there's a big adjustment up or down because actually nobody reads the meter, and eventually the meter reader comes out every two years or so. And, and in the meantime, they've had estimated bills. Um, so actually, you've got no visibility at all. But you really want to try and get uh, as much visibility as you can, because then you can start to look at what the trends are around your energy use. And you can start actually to, to make some, some gains relatively quickly. Um, 
So, for example, this is a, a data set um, from an organization I was looking at earlier in the year, and they have half hourly data, um, which they've never looked at. Um, so I pulled up some of the half hourly data and had a look at it. Uh, and immediately I was slightly struck by some slightly weird things going on. I don't know if you can see on there, but uh, this is a this is a period of about two weeks, I think. And on a couple of days, there's a very noticeable sudden spike in electricity use um, at sort of lunchtime-ish. And then it drops a bit and carries on and it runs through until sometime the next day it sort of drops down again. Um, and and uh, any any thoughts about what that might be? Do you want to uh, take yourself off mute and reassure me you're still awake uh, and, and chip in? Has anybody got any thoughts on, on what's happening there? It's a, it's a very real world organizational issue that I'm sure some of Somebody you left will the be other facing. Door. Close. Is it someone? I can say, is it someone doing something? Sorry, you broke up a bit there, but do you want to say that again? The staff doing something at lunchtime. Well, what it turned out to be was someone had a panel heater under their desk because they felt the cold, and fairly randomly. Sometime around the middle of the day, they think it was a bit cold in here, and they turn on their little panel heater, which would then produce it would use sort of somewhere up to about three kilowatts until the thermostat kicked in, and then it'd be kicking in and out. And obviously, the 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 the, the top line in the sort of small hours of the morning. Can you see my arrow if I'm doing that? Can you see an arrow or not? I'm not sure whether you can, but yes. Um, that was obviously a cold night, so the heater was, was working quite hard to try and heat the whole room up during the night. And then they'd come in the next morning and think, oh, it's a bit hot in here, and turn it off again. Um, and that that is a very real-world thing that happens. Um, uh, again, you'll find that you have, have um, buildings with not very good heating, where the people using the building don't really feel they have any impairment to change the heating of the building. So they equip themselves with little heaters to keep themselves warm. Uh, and then they're not very good remembering to turn them on off. So just, just as a sort of a quick example of the sort of thing that happens, um, your gas use can be harder to, to, to manage because a lot of buildings are still on old meters that only basically you can you can get a reading every, you know, even if you went to the effort of going and reading the meter every day, um, you know, that's a lot of work to do. Um, and, and and then you're only seeing a, a period. But you can you can if you've got reliable periodic meter readings, um, you can interpret information from them, and it can be of use. So, for example, this is a this is an example of a um, it's actually a sort of town hall stroke museum stroke pizza restaurant that very common combination that we see all the time, um, and this is their gas use. Um, some of it's estimated, but it's some of it's real. And they decided to try turning all the thermostats down when they closed in December, because they, they this is a museum that isn't, isn't open during December at all. So the green lines, that's the pizza restaurant's gas use. And that's where the estimated comes in because we didn't have any sub metering. So we had to estimate how much gas the pizza restaurant used. And it is quite a lot of gas because they have these amazing big um, Italian pizza ovens and they wanted to, to to see what the effect of that was and so if you just look at the gas data yes the gas use went down to December but what we don't know is was it just a very mild December you also need to know the other very important bit of information was what was the weather doing unfortunately it's relatively easy to get a thing called degree days data which tells you basically roughly what the temperatures were on average over that period and and you can see that actually you'd expected the december gas used to, to to rise further but it came down so so they did save some money in december um so so you can use some of these tools to help you to assess the impact of any changes you're making and with respect to electricity um i've just told you that it was 193 grams per 
kilowatt hour of CO2 is what's in the reporting guide. Actually, the grid intensity average for 2022 is 157. Um, why they use 193 for reporting, I haven't quite got to the bottom of. Um, but anyway, and the really important thing is that the intensity of um, carbon intensity of grid electricity is coming down quite rapidly. So if you look at the little graph to the bottom left hand side, um, this is blue line is electricity carbon. So you can see that it, it, back in 2010, we were up at sort of 500. Um, as I say, last year we we're down at 157. And by 2030 odd, we'll be down at probably 40 odd. And, it, and then the, the, the decline slightly slower after that, because that's this period here is basically when we've been building a lot of offshore wind. And that's that's why the carbon grid has become so decarbonized. And you will see it, that, you know, in various debates that are going around around COP at the moment, that the UK government is saying, well, it's all right for us to sign lots of new oil and gas licenses because we are we're world leaders in decarbonisation. Um, and it's slightly disingenuous because actually we've we've had some very easy pickings. We have amazing wind resource, way better than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, when I used to be a wind developer, um, we did a piece of analysis to look at where where in the world should we be developing wind. And the windiest places are the UK, um, Patagonia and Somalia. Um, so so we felt that staying in the UK seemed like quite a good decision. Um, and on the right hand side, the other point about the carbon on electricity is it actually moves around just during the day and from day to day. So this is just, I just picked four fairly random days from this year without a great deal of thought. So I've got, what have I got? I've got the uh, the blue line is the 25th of November. So that's quite a recent one. Uh, the orange line is the 17th of November. And then I've got some from earlier in the year. So the gray line was back in April and the yellow line was in February. Um, and I, it's probably a bit, do you want, you're waving your hand at me, Sally. Is you, you've got a question. Do you want to ask it? Yeah, it's a bit of a general question, though. So I was going to wait till you finished your sentence. Or oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> I, I, I can. I probably okay. can't remember where I was I going with realized... that sentence anyway. Okay. Well, I am trying very hard to concentrate on what you say, and I. But I keep looking at this and thinking I don't really understand this slide. So I wonder right. if I could ask you a really <laughs> simple question about yes, it. Yes, please do. Yes. So the title of the slide is measuring. Yes. Uh, but this is this is this is measuring for. Yeah, I don't. I, I have to say, but, I've lost it. That's fine. Time. So we're, what we're talking about Average here is measuring carbon intensity. The carbon intensity of your electricity. So your electricity and that's is measured. In British households. Yeah, in British it? households. So your measure, measurement of electricity is kilowatt hours. But you've got to turn that into yes. the equivalent to carbon dioxide emissions. Right. So if you look at what happened last year, so for last year, for 20, 2022, you can look at your electricity bills and it'll say you, your electricity bill added up to, say, 3,000 kilowatt hours. And then you want to know what does that mean in terms of carbon? OK, so is this so, an average for all the different types of electricity that, so I don't know, I don't even know who we get it from anymore. But so if we are get, buying green electricity in, in, in inverted commas, yep. Is this is that figure there an average for all the different types of electricity people have? Well, this is the thing you see, which is a bit tricky for people. But it it doesn't whoever you've decided to buy from and whatever tariff you're on, what comes out of your plug is what's on the grid at the time. Right. So for net zero calculations, you have to take what the grid is. You can't say, ah, oh, but I chose to, to go to ecotricity and yep. therefore I've got no carbon in my electricity at all. Okay. Because unfortunately it doesn't work like that. Right, that's very which important is, to me. Which is not to say that it's not a good idea to use a green tariff because by using a green tariff, what you're doing is you're putting your money into the organisations that are investing in low carbon electricity. I've got more questions. So... Yep. The second half of that top sentence, yep. though note that 193 is in their reporting guide. Who's the yep. there in that sentence? The government. 
government. It's the, the big they with the capital T, the government. The people that are monitoring our call right now. Um, I, still don't, I still don't really understand, though, what's the significance yeah. of... So the first figure, the 157, whose figure is that? That's from that from from the grid. That's from from National Grid. So and National Grid, the, the organisation National yep. Grid, yep. say it's one five seven. Yeah. But the government says it's one nine three. Is that what you're yes, saying? Yes. And the reason one of the reasons they're a bit different is the government need to report the number that will be used by everybody for their formal reporting before you get to the end of the year because people report quarterly. So the 193 will be the government saying, what's a safe number to use that if we, everybody uses it, that will be a reasonable estimate of what electricity will look like. By the time we got to the end of the year, actually, the real, the real world average had come out a bit lower. And I guess one of the reasons I'm slightly, okay. I mean, the only reason really for mentioning that is I'm slightly um, aware that a lot of the things we're going to talk about is about going from um so is that another question or are you just being friendly that's uh, leslie leaving i think <laughs> oh, i think okay. right. waving okay <laughs> excellent um I'm, I'm conscious that we're saying to people you should be moving to using electricity rather than using gas and it wouldn't be an unfair question to say but if gas is 182 grams per kilowatt hour and electricity is 193 why are we doing that and Firstly, actually, 193 is a bit of a high number. But secondly, very importantly, that little graph on the bottom left hand side is showing you it's because electricity is coming down fast. And so by moving away from using gas and oil and moving towards using electricity, we are effectively hitching our wagon to the national grid's decarbonisation work. And we will get the gradual reduction and elimination of carbon from anything that's electrical powered. Um, so that that's quite important. Um, and and the graph on the right, the importance of that is that not all days are the same and not all times of day are the same. Um, and it is generally true, but not always, that electricity is lower carbon in the middle of the night. Um, and what I was just going to bring out from that graph is also to make the point that this is the, the carbon is quite weather dependent. So that 17th of November, um, which is a little while back to cast your mind back, but it was a period when we had high pressure, nice, nice sunshine and no wind. And because we had no wind, the national grid were having to run the gas power stations to keep the electricity going. And that boosts the carbon content of the electricity because we're having to rely on on gas whereas in um, back in april the gray line that was a nice windy period and we weren't, weren't having to burn hardly any gas at all so that gave us nice clean electricity and a fairly typical pattern would be the blue and the yellow lines where we have enough wind to cover most of the electricity at, when we're not using huge amounts but then come six seven in the morning when we all turn everything on then we need to turn on the gas powered power stations and the carbon content goes up comes down a bit in the middle of the day and then it goes up again in the evenings as we as we turn everything on again um and that's that's sometimes can be a, a useful thing to bear in mind because we can make use of that and i'll talk a bit about that uh, uh, later on because if we can use electricity in the middle of the night rather than using it during peak periods, then it is actually lower carbon electricity, if that makes sense. It may not, it, it's not critical to follow every, every bit of that, I have to say. Um, scope three, um, which I talked about before, which is all the other things other than your bills, uh, is, is harder. And we are gonna go into this in a bit more detail in one of the later sessions to look at the ways and the tools you can use to measure these. Um, and so travel, that there are tools for that. You can take assumptions around things like water and sewage. So it is true that um, if you can use less water, that will save carbon. Um, and generally speaking, on the what comes in goes out basis, if you're using less water, you're probably also using less sewage. 
um, and so that you get a sort of a, a double benefit there. Um, if you're if you're using a commercial waste collector, actually they're they're under a, a, a legal obligation to tell you what the carbon impact is of your waste, um, and that will enable you to put some numbers to your recycling, but to, versus your you know what goes to landfill. And as I said, purchasing things you buy, it's 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 a developing space. It is becoming more common. If so, if if you were a Ford Motor Company or or Toyota or someone, then actually every component you buy would come with a lifetime carbon um, number, which covers its manufacture, its transport to your plant, and also its disposal. And that's that's an obligation within big industries to do that. But if you're just buying, I don't know, a stapler from 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 uh, Ryman's, it probably doesn't tell you what its carbon is at the moment. Um, and so and it, it, it'll be small anyway. So as it, on the priorities basis, you, that's not something to stress over because it'll generally be a reasonably small amount. Um, so um, we, we're getting through reasonably well. Um, we're going to move on to thinking about the, the action you need to, to cover. But before we do that, let's just pause and just have a, have a, 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 a quick think through any other questions that that has in your head, because I'm sure that will have triggered some, some questions. Um, again, apologies if, if, if it felt like it was traveling through a bit fast. Um, I'm, I'm actually slightly ahead of time. I'm, I'm five minutes early, so, so maybe I was going faster than I needed to. But, but do do please, if you've got any questions, now is the time. I was only going to say that, um, A, I'd forgotten this is being recorded, so I'm not really sure that I'm supposed to chat or not, but I'm just, you've asked me, so I'm going to go, go now. <laughs> scope one and scope two, I think I've got those. Scope yep. three, haven't got those, but I'm guessing that I don't, I mean, I need to know vaguely what they are, but they're things that other people are going to have to monitor and sort out rather than me. Is that right? Is that scope three? Um, it, it depends on, on the decisions you're making. But it, 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 in scope three, for example, yeah. is staff travel. Yeah, so, no, there are more things in there yeah. than I realise. So, yeah. so in, in the case of, of, of Share, for example, you trundle around and go and see museums around the countryside. Um, so actually, one of the things that would be a sensible thing to do is to set a budget for your for your travel carbon and manage against it. And then you'll be doing things like saying, oh, well, I want to go and visit Cromer or whatever. Maybe I need to go on the on the train. You'll be very pleased to know uh, that apparently can, we've already can, got that, one. That be... I only found that out this morning, but we've already got That's one. good. Apparently. Excellent. <laughs> Well, having one is good. Being aware of it and 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 uh, knowing where you are against the budget would be even better. But yeah. But yeah. So so that that you know it's it, different for different organisations. I wouldn't have thought that Country and Eastern have a lot of staff travel. Um, but if we if you're thinking one. about your wider activities, yeah. Well. Well, I think I'm probably the worst for staff travel. Well, but I think on some of the projects, yeah. we're doing sort of uh, overseas travel. Yeah. So there, yeah. Are, there are occasional flights to India. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, Can you and, hear us? You know, it's okay. Yeah, you're slightly crackly. You're, you're, you're slightly Dalek-y, but, but we can sort of make out what you're saying. Um, but it, in terms of your of your business, then... Occasional travel to India is an essential part of your business, um, so so that's that's necessary. But what you might want to be looking at is ways in which you can um, mitigate the carbon from that, and you and that's really where you get down to things where the only choice is some offsetting, and then you need to be looking right. at making sure that offsetting is is real and credible, uh, and and um, and that that's a whole another topic that we can we can we could go into, but that that's not for today. But that's I that, mean, is, that is a problem. Yeah, uh, what we have done over the last uh, three years since COVID is place more of our orders for um, the museum shop uh, uh, by 
sending images over the over the uh, internet and uh, getting mm -hmm. them to send uh, photographs back and that's had a significant effect actually because we were probably spending four or five thousand pounds on uh, on uh, airfares and so forth mm -hmm. and that's been reduced pretty much to zero but having said that one still got to uh, make a trip every now and then yep. and then but on the other side of the coin we have the um, work that we do on our on the museum side where we're just embarking on a new project uh, in, in, in the Himalayas. And uh, that's definitely going to require the people go hmm. there. There, there, we have, there we have a network of, uh, of people working on the project, some of which are resident in, yeah, in I was India. gonna say, a lot of the team on that project are actually quite local to Himachal, aren't they? Mm, Pradesh, yeah. so that's, that's been quite good for us to look at, say, that the travel costs are less for that or the travel you know impact is less for that because people will yep. be working quite less to it yeah. yeah that's interesting and, and generally speaking a lot of what we're talking about here where you're effectively saving energy and saving carbon you're saving money as well um, we're going to come on to some of the things you might want to do which will cost some money to set them up <coughs> But once you've done them, they will also then be reducing your running costs and saving money. So um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the things should, should be quite well aligned. Um, and I think, you know, it, I, I, I spent the first part of my career traveling all over the world without even thinking twice about it. Um, and some of it's just being a bit more aware of it and thinking about the alternatives. But th there will still be some some need for travel, undoubtedly. And... I think the other thing that sh around this whole space, which is important, is that, uh, I mean, again, absolutely imperative akin to, to, to managing your finances. I mean, one of the ways of managing your finances is you just feel really guilty about spending any money ever. And the, you just hope that it'll be fine. And, and quite a lot of people actually run their personal finances on exactly that basis. Well, I ought to be able to afford this, so I'll buy it or what. I feel guilty about having bought it now but that's not, that's not really a very rational way to, to manage something and the whole point about having properly thought through budgets is that then you if you if you've looked at it and you said well we need to do you know three flights to india this year and that's in the budget that's fine you don't feel guilty about it because it's essential to, to running your organization um and you've taken that decision because that's the the, the right decision for you um and if you if you said, well, you know, previously we were doing eight flights to India, but now by using um, more, um, getting more samples sent backwards and forwards and doing more on, on photographs and so on, we managed to cut that. That's great. Um, and that, that you, you can have a, a, you know, feel that you've achieved something there. Um, but it, it, it shouldn't be a thing where it's starting to load people with guilt about the fact that they, they have to drive to work. Um, that, that's not really the point of it. What it might do is it might be a thing that you can encourage people to think about whether there are alternatives so that um, if, if instead of driving to work, they do a car share or if they instead of driving, they use the bus, then you want to make sure they feel that they've actually achieved something from that. And if you're measuring the, um, the carbon from people traveling to and from work and you're tracking it and you can say, look, isn't it great? We've actually achieved something. That, that that can have a have a big impact. I, I did a job for an organization based out in Virginia and they actually have moved offices so that they're at a transport hub and they have a reward scheme for all their staff and effectively they track the staff commuting and, and a whole lot of their staff who would always have driven just because that's what you do in America. You go out your front door, you get in your car and you drive and get out at work. And a whole load of their staff now travel by train to the office, and it's had a major impact. And and you know, and and they celebrate it, and they and they and they, you know, they they, they the organisation treats it as important, um, and it has really made a difference. Um, Anything else on that? John Matthew had a question about solar panels and tips about those, but I wonder if that's more what we're covering. Um, in that's in the second half. No, no, no peaking. We have to wait till we get there. But yes, we will be talking about it in the second half. Should we? Should we take a sort of a, a, a five-minute break? Um, 
quick quick uh, comfort break and we'll restart at if we can start promptly at five past is that okay good good crash on okay good well welcome back everybody um so we've talked a lot about the numbers and how we how we try and sort of assess our carbon but obviously what we really want to do is do something about it um and i'm going to talk about three areas um some some in more detail than, than others about things that we can do to change the the path we're on to to reduce our carbon into the future um so we touched on this um before we were talk, talking to um this question that Sally raised about um some of the things that are organizational um so switching tariffs um it, it sounds slightly contradictory to say well it doesn't actually make any difference to your net zero but it does actually uh, make a difference into the market um and i think switching tariffs to a, a fully green tariff five or six years ago actually made a huge difference in the market it really did signal because what what it actually does is 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 in terms of the electricity supply you've got all of the offshore wind farms putting in the onshore wind farms and you've got the nuclear power stations putting energy onto the grid and then you've got some um, biomass from from drax that's, that's burning lots of wood chip which is potentially controversial but it but it is sort of theoretically um, renewable and then you've got the gas that's being burnt in the gas fired power stations to make up the rest and when you buy a green tariff what you're doing is you're saying on average i want to buy the stuff that came from all the green places what it means is what's left is all the polluting stuff and and people who are not on a green tariff are then by definition buying all of that but the whole effect the net effect you still got to buy what what gets generated uh, you're not actually changing the generation mix but what it has done is it's made it more attractive to generators to generate renewable energy because they could get paid a premium in the market for it over the last five or ten years and that really did help kick start all of the build of the wind farms and the offshore wind and so on so it has really made a difference um i think you could probably argue now that it makes less of a difference because all of the transition we're now going through is mandated by government policy and so on um and so for, as, a, as an individual consumer our influence is is probably less cr critical um but but it's still a good thing to do um things like changing to fully recycled paper um is is a good thing to do um the, the, again the the actual carbon impact of that is relatively small um but but reusing and recycling and so on are 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 helpful um but but you know some of this you get some blurring of the lines um so um you know you need you need to do the maths as it is as it were and you need to actually add up and work out what the impact is um cycle to work schemes you know i think uh norfolk county council has a cycle to work scheme where you can you can buy a bike out of your your salary before tax and it encourages people to think about doing that and, and, and thinking about cycling to work that can make a difference um so there's some there's some policies that you that, that an organization can set um that will help to to encourage um you know sort of carbon reduction and I think one of the key things with that is that it's it's also about um, the message that's going out to your organization um, because leadership is quite important. Um, if it's seen as being a, an organizational priority and, and the leadership of an organization is seen to treat as a serious, then people will follow and people will, will comply. Um, but um, if they're only playing lip service, um, then the achievement will be limited and and critically uh, in terms of that 
it's because behavior is is really quite an important one of these um, so changing individual behavior um, can be the thing that has the biggest impact for the least cost um, and i see this all the time in the work i do um, going out and, and surveying um, organizations for, for carbon reduction um, that, that time and again the thing that's so striking particularly in, in you know, slightly old-fashioned larger organizations is that individuals in the organization don't feel empowered to make a change at all to anything um, this can be particularly true around for example heating systems uh, the number of times I'll go into a building that's overheated with the windows open and say, well, why, why have you got the windows open? They say, well, it's too hot. They say, well, why do you turn the heating down? Well, that, 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 we, we don't have any power to do that. It's not us. That's building services. Or, or you know, why have you still got all these really old, old-fashioned, high-energy light bulbs? Oh, well, you know, it's, that's, that we haven't got the capital to, to do that. It's not us. And the the the... the organizational tolerance of poor performance is is a is a major problem in this sector as it is as in other things um i always used to say to people i don't i don't want i want intolerant people working in <laughs> working here i want people to be intolerant if something's not right don't tolerate it you know talk about it ask about it make a fuss um so empowering um every member of staff to feel that it's their job to help look after the, the energy that you use is is a really powerful tool and and i mean irrespective of the impact on 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 the planet the impact on your energy bills is is quite an important one um and in terms of your sort of organization, one of the things you might want to think about also is behavior of visitors and thinking about nudging visitors. So things like encouraging them to use public transport by putting that on your website. We, we went to, to do a, a, a thing at a museum in the Midlands recently. And so I just hopped onto their website to, to see how to find them. And there was lengthy descriptions of how to get there by air. Um, there was a detailed, uh, um, uh, explanation of how to reach them from all the various motorway junctions. Um, it didn't say anything at all about whether there was, whether there was any bus service or by train or anything, any of those things at all. Um, and <laughs> when we were there, and we, we pointed this out. They were they were quite surprised, really. It never occurred to any of them, and they said, "Well, I don't, I don't know how that happened." And and they came to the conclusion that actually the, the whoever had done the website they just said to the web developer we want a page that explains how to get here, and no one had ever really looked at it, um, or thought about it in terms of what it, what message it was sending to to the yeah. visitors. So yeah, so encourage visitors to 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 travel um, uh, by by a sensible way, and I think you know some of the some of the behavioural stuff around. Um, that can impact uh, um, organize, uh, the, the building's um, energy use. It's also things like, you know, shutting doors. Um, and if, if you arrive somewhere and the doors are all wide open on a cold day, and you say, well, why, why are the doors open? Well, we want to be welcoming. I think, well, yes, but what about the energy loss? Well, you know, that's not their responsibility. The, the, uh, their front of house responsibility is just to be welcoming. They don't have to think about any of the other consequences. Um, and I don't know if, you, if, if any of you uh, uh, ever come into Norwich, but you, as you go around Norwich, you may see that some of the shops have have the doors shut and a little sign up saying, you know, please come in, we are open. And they're keeping the doors shut to save energy. And there's a bit of a campaign that we've, that's been running in, in Norwich to try to encourage shops not to leave all the doors open um, and, and waste heat. Um, so, yeah, so, but it's all about getting people to feel that they've got some ownership of it as an issue and they've got some agency to affect things and and they're encouraged to 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 uh, to, to do so um, and so linked into that is providing feedback to staff to say 
what impact they've had. So if you've got a, a team of volunteers, if there's if there's a, a you know sort of a an area you can put up a display board and and start sticking up some of the numbers and tracking this year against last year or this month against last month. That's a really powerful way of providing that feedback. It comes back to our sort of happy face, sad face thing. Um, of of <laughs> so um, that providing ways of, of of making people feel involved can be really powerful. As I, I can't emphasise enough the, the the number of of times that I've seen energy wastage um, just because people don't feel they're empowered. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe one for Matthew. I did, did a project last year on a whole lot of MOD sites, one of which was a major um, logistics storage site. And it, had, it was a large site and it had nine storage units of 10,000 square meters each. These are big, big buildings, um, all of which are heated, gas heated, huge amounts of energy use. Uh, and it wasn't me that went to site to do the survey, but the guy that went to site to do the survey said he went around the site and of the nine storage units, all but two of them were empty. But all the heating was on. And so he said to the guys in the in the building, what this is why are you heating this empty building? Bearing in mind these are these are not new buildings. They're made, they're really just sort of large corrugated iron sheds. So all the heat goes straight out again. And they said, Oh, well, there's people working in the offices. And at the end of each of the buildings is a small row of single story offices. And each of these had some two or three people sat in there with all the heating on. And said, so, well, but why are you heating the whole building you know, if, if all you need is the office? And they said, well, the heating's either on or off. We don't have any control over it. And through that process of, of one of the things that came out of that was then we did a review of that. And of course, what happens in that world is that the people that use all those defense buildings are all they're all defense logistics um, people, but the buildings are owned and managed by defense infrastructure, which is a completely different organization. So the people that use those buildings have no idea about what the energy bills are. There's no connectivity. There's nothing to to, to make them think when they turn the heating on in an empty building that that's costing some money. Um, and so that that was that was such an easy way of saving money. Never, never mind about insulating the buildings. Just just turn the heating off. <laughs> that was the, that was the main solution. So yeah. So feedback and, and recognition is important. So if you've done those things, then really what you're then coming on to is other ways of cutting how much energy you use, and this is where it starts to become a bit more crunchy with, with money involved. Because some of these are things where really you've got to start spending money, you've got to start investing in your in your building, um, typically, in order to, 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 re to reduce your carbon. And, and so the, again, this very much needs planning, it needs an understanding of what the cost impacts are in terms of the capital cost up front, but also what you're going to save downstream. Um, so I'm going to talk through three bits of this. I'm going to talk about just ways you can reduce your energy use um, firstly, and then I'm going to talk which are the, which are the sort of the, the, a lot of them are the easier ones, and then changing your heat to decarbonize heat, which is a fairly major expenditure. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, and a little bit about on-site generation. So, for example, um, solar power and so on. Um, and um, there is going to be another session in this series talking about funding sources. And if you're looking at um, one of the more expensive things like changing a heat source or generating on-site electricity from 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 uh, solar power or so on, then then that would be um, probably of interest to you because we'll be talking about some of the sources of funding that can help um, with those sort of larger capital projects. Um, so. If we just start by thinking about um, the ways in which you can reduce your energy use, um, and and this is very much thinking about within your own buildings, really now we're, we're focusing in on, um, uh, and some of it's a bit dull, um, but some of it is also um, really 
straightforward to make a decision on because it was, it'll just pay for itself very quickly and save money. So in terms of reduced energy use, I'm just going to talk about these five areas, um, lighting, managing your heat use and managing your temperatures, other unnecessary heat loss reduction, uh, building insulation, and then um, just to keep Sally on her toes, we're going to talk about time of use um, and go back to that horrible graph about what goes on during the day. Um, because that is uh, of interest, I think, for some organizations. So let's start with lighting. <clears throat> um, I, I, I continue to be amazed um, by how many places you go around that still have non-LED lighting. Um, and one of the things I find is that there's a perception that if they've got fluorescent lighting, that's low energy, and so it's all right. Um, and and things like halogen down lighters. It was, oh, no, no, those are low energy because they, they, were, they were fitted to be low energy. And you say, well, when were they fitted to be low energy? And you find they were fitted 15 years ago and they were slightly lower energy as halogen down lighters than using old fashioned um, bulbs. But they're not low energy by, by modern standards. Um, so just to taking the example of halogen down lighters, um, Typical halogen bulb is 35 watts. Typical LED replacement of the same brightness is three and a half watts. So, so, so it is quite a dramatic change. Um, and and fluorescent tubes um, and fluorescent bulbs, you know, they, they were low energy 10 years ago because they were lower energy than the old incandescent ones that we've had since the time of Edison. Um, but that they're much higher energy use than than LEDs, and particularly fluorescent tubes. You know, a 58 watt tube for the same brightness as a 16 watt LED tube. Um, so it is the case that um, changing your bulbs is is a sensible thing to do. And then then people say, oh yes, no, but but you know, it, it, we'd have to change all the fittings, and and it's and it's complicated, and we have electricians in. Actually, now there's pretty much every type of light fitting you may have. There will be a direct replacement LED that you can just fit without having to change the fittings. In the case of, of fluorescent tubes, if you've got a lot of fluorescent tubes in in, in your sheds, for example, um, then you can just replace the tube. You can now buy an LED replacement. It costs about 10 quid per tube. Um, and if you're if you're using your lights more than you know a few hours a day, it'll pay for itself in in sort of inside a year. Um, so, but there's you know but, but organisations have all sorts of reasons for, for not doing it. I'm, one of the things I do is I'm involved in a in, in a sailing yard on the Broads. Um, they have a whole shed full of fluorescent tubes. I've explained to them that because they're on all the time, every day from eight in the morning to late at night, all year round. I'll explain to them the payback on changing the, um, the tubes um, is about, for them, it's about four months. Uh, and the trustees at the last meeting have, have decided not to do it because they didn't have any capital budget. And, oh, and the other thing was that the yard manager pointed out she just bought some spare tubes and it would be a shame not to use them. <laughs> so yeah, Sally. Now I'm going to have to ask the, the uh, ignorant person's question here. Because when I look at a light bulb, I have no idea if it's incandescent, halogen, or LED. I'm just wondering, all those pictures on the right-hand slide, what are they all so that it will help me try and identify them? I mean, that bottom, the very bottom with the finger stick tubes, I recognise yep. that because that, I think, is an early version of uh, low energy light bulb. Yep, it, it's a, a fluorescent. The rest one. of them, I really have no idea. It's very, what very, they are it's very, and... very easy to tell. Um, touch it. Is if, it? Yeah, touch it. If it's hot, change it. Hmm. Because that's that's okay. what that's what the efficiency is. They're both producing the same amount of light, but the reason why an LED is so much more efficient is it doesn't produce heat; it just produces light. Right. So all of the others produce heat. That's very yep. useful. Thank you very much. Yep. Because I if, it, really if it's an incandescent one, 
don't don't just grab it because it'll burn your fingers. But yeah, <laughs> slight sort of health and safety warning. But if you e even a fluorescent tube, if you put your hand up to it and feel it, it's quite warm. Um, because because the it, it you know it it is a lot more efficient than than an incandescent light was, but but it's still relatively um, uh, expensive to run compared with a um, an LED. So my other question is then: all those pictures uh, yeah. inside, yeah. are they are yeah. they all bad? Are any of them LEDs? Can you tell? No, by so what you've got there is the first column is. The first column is all the bad stuff. The second column is what you replace it with. And the oh. fact that you can't really easily tell them apart is, is the point that actually that you're just changing the bulb. Oh, so that one at the bottom uh, with the finger ones I thought was a good one. It's not, it's that, a bad one. That's, that's an old fluorescent right. style um, bulb replacement. And typically that would be like an 11 watt. If it was a bright one, if it was the equivalent of a 100 watt bulb, old, old school. In old money, that would be a hundred watt bulb, um, right. and and the LED will be sort of six and a half, seven. Um, so there's a question from country in Eastern, I think. South Asia yes, question at the top of the page. I've got a, a question. I think what are the advantages? Yeah, uh, we we have changed most of our uh, bulbs into LEDs, apart from the. Um, uh, the fluorescent tubes, which on the basis of what you said, I think we'll go ahead and do. But one of the advantages of the LED, particularly also in a domestic situation, is that, is that you don't get any fire risk. I, I noticed a number of electricians have said that uh, with, the old, uh, um, with the old bulbs, because of the intensity of the heat, there was a, even a possibility of fire risk with those older ones. And uh, mm. certainly with the new LEDs, as you say, you, you can feel them. They're, they're relatively cool and unlikely to cause any uh, any fire risk, particularly mm. in recessed ceilings and so forth. I did I did see a, an article saying that, that one of the things that has been uh, they've seen is that children getting burnt by light bulbs has, is now a thing that don't, never used to be a thing because previous generations of children knew that light bulbs were hot. And now you have, you know, children going and visiting their grandparents' house, not realising that light bulbs can be hot. And their grandparents have still got, you know, incandescent 60 watt bulbs. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, and I think there was a lot of resistance to LED. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so it, it should be a bit of a, a, an easy one that to go through. And look. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you're, you're slightly, your sound's slightly coming and going there, but I think we got we got the gist of that, and, I, I, and yeah, I think it's it, it's good to do that. Um, now, in terms of the 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 impact of that on your carbon and and your energy costs and so on, for most organisations, lighting isn't a isn't a huge um, energy cost, but it's just an easy one because it it it, it really should pay for itself. Um, the one that really is a, 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 a sort of low-hanging fruit is managing heat use, um, and this is the, the the thing that in all of the, the work I do around um, decarbonisation for organisations, it's the thing that that is always the, the very first thing to, to 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 look at in terms of value for money, managing the heat in your building better. So there's two parts to this. One is that you really want to make sure that you're not overheating any of the spaces for the way in which they're used. Um, there is um, you know, an, a, a tendency um, to, to, to slightly overheat buildings more than you need to. And it does have a, a really big impact. And encouraging people to try turning their thermostats down a little bit, in, in certainly in public spaces, in galleries and things like that, um, it, it, I mean, there's all sorts of benefits of not overheating uh, old buildings as well. But um, having slightly lower um, temperatures in places where people aren't sitting is 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 important. And I'm going to talk a bit more about 
that in, in a minute around um, uh, managing the use of space as well. Um, but the first thing really is to make sure that your heating system is actually delivering the heat you want at the times that you want it and not more than you want or, or less than you want as well, to be fair, uh, and at the times you don't want it. Um, and an old fashioned heating system very often will have one thermostat somewhere on a wall that decides whether the boiler's on or off. And then you might have thermostatic valves on your radiators that decide whether or not to turn the radiator up or down in a particular space. And as an absolute minimum, you want to make sure that you've got your radiator valves set correctly so they're not overheating the spaces and you've got your time clock set so it's not turning the heater on any more than it needs to so that it comes on obviously a little bit before you open but not more than you need it to and probably turns off before you close so that you're not heating the building beyond the time when when you need to and on a seven day timer so that you're matching that to your times of opening but that's a really old-fashioned way of, of managing your your heating um, if you've got if you find you've got a situation where windows are being opened by people because it's too hot or people are wanting to have, have a, an electric heater under their desk because they're too cold, then really you want to try and get it properly sorted rather than having sort of like sticking plaster solutions like that. And we, the world of building control has moved forward in leaps and bounds in the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, I mean, even on a domestic level. So I have a system in my house which is which is why that actually where that picture comes from, which is has two uh, thermostats in different bits of the building, but also we have a number of radiators that have smart radiator valves that also have a, a thermostat, and that means that we can control different rooms in the house at different times of day. So I'm sat downstairs in our office, and the heating is on during the day in here, but nowhere else in the building. Um, and we would only heat the upstairs um, rooms just for a short bit before we go to bed and, and a little bit in the mornings when we're getting up. But the rest of the time, that's unheated. And so first of all, it's, it's actually controlling the heat at the right level at the right times. The other thing about the electronic um, radiator valves is they're actually controlling to a temperature. So you can say this, for example, is an office space. This is set to 21 degrees, which is a standard temperature you'd want if you're just sitting still all day. And actually, with a high degree of reliability, the system does control this space to be 21 degrees. Um, if you have the sort of somewhere between one to five on a on a sort of mechanical radiator valve, you don't really know which of those settings is, is equates to being the right temperature. And the tendency is, if particularly in organisations where, where different people are using different spaces, someone comes and says, oh, it's a bit cold in here, and turns it up to full. They don't turn it down again because they don't think about that. And then the next person comes and says, oh, it's a bit hot in here, and turns it off. And and that that's such a common thing. I, 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 was, I went around a whole lot of ambulance stations in the, in the East Midlands um, over the last couple of months doing surveys. And pretty much every one of those, they said, oh, well, the problem is the night crew come in and turn the heating up to maximum, and then the day crew come in and turn it off. And I, I, it's one of those things where, where you have to sort of end up ranting at people about the idea of a thermostat. You know, it's from, you know, from, from, the, from the Latin, thermos meaning hot, and stat meaning leave the bloody thing alone. It, the whole point of a the thermostat should be that you set it to what you want the thing to control to, and then you leave it to control to that. In practice, um, the sort of mechanical radiator valves are, are not particularly sophisticated devices, and so they're not very reliable. And of course, it may be that in your building, you've got an old heating system with, with large, you know, cast iron Victorian radiators and a big black knob on it. And there's no, you know, you can't fit modern valves to it. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't have that level of sophistication. Um, but actually, the, the, there is the, coming onto the market now a new building management systems that use some of the sort of huge advances we've got in, in sensor and actuator um, technology to bring costs down. So in my case, for example, the thermostatic radiator valves I've got here, the, which are the electronic ones, 
I think they're about forty pounds each. So they're not very cheap, but they're a highly sophisticated bit of electronics, um, and they talk directly to, but via the you know via Wi-Fi to the hub. The whole thing's connect controlled wirelessly, um, and I've got very clear data. I can look on the system on my phone from anywhere in the world and see what what the temperature control is. And if we want it a bit warmer, I can I can adjust it. Um, it has in a facility where if people are feeling a bit cold, they can turn it up. But at the next time it gets to the end of the day, it resets it back to the standard program. So again, you know, if you've got a thing where people are feeling a bit cold and you want to turn it up a bit, you can. But that doesn't then mean it just gets left on on full forever. So for most buildings, looking at the way in which they manage their um, temperature control is is quite important. Um, I, I mean. Uh, You'll all have different heating systems, I'm sure. Uh, I, I I did a review of a museum up in the Dales where they have quite a sophisticated, recently refurbished building, um, which has quite you know quite a good building management system. And then outside, they have a number of railway carriages that they use for part of their display, but also as a sort of learning centre and so on, which has little um, air-to-air. They're like little air conditioning units, really, but they're used for heat, air to air units all the way through it. And on the day I went to do the survey it was in the winter when the when the museum was closed because it was closed the winter. And I went to survey the carriages and they were at something like 28 degrees. I mean, they were absolutely roasting hot. Um, so I went back in and questioned this and said, well, why, why is the heating on out there? And they said, oh, oh, well, we've obviously forgotten to change the time switch settings because it's on a time switch. I said, well, how, why is it so hot? What, what, you know, what are they set to? And they said, well, they're all, they've all got individual controllers, um, and people turn them up because they're cold, and then, and and that's the thing where they were able to to make a very simple change, and buy a small little infrared unit that sits in the, each of the rooms where there's one of those devices. It mimics what the remote controls for those units do and talks to the internet. And now the front desk. Can see what the temperature is in the railway carriages. Can turn the heating off if it's not being used, just just from their from their um, front desk computer, um, and that's going to save them an absolute fortune this year. Um, so th there's new technology coming along all the time. So whatever your particular heating system is, it's worth having a review of that and having a think about what could be done um, to change it. And coming back to the prioritised thing, that definitely ought to be quite high with priorities because saving heat um, can be by far the biggest impact. Um, turning the turning the, the temperatures down one or two degrees in spaces where they don't need to be quite so well heated, that, that can have a really major impact on your energy use. Um, so that's a, in a sense is a really easy, a, a easy one to do because nobody can see that you've done it and it doesn't offend anybody. Um, Unnecessary heat loss and and also the related to that insulation is is a bit more complicated, particularly in heritage buildings. Um, but trying to minimise drafts, I'll talk a bit more about drafts is important. Um, trying to um, manage the airflow through through buildings is important. Thinking about whether that you can fit an inner lobby. There's an example there of a church that's got a a, a glass box sitting inside the main door. So that when the main doors open, um, they're not actually opening the whole space to the outside world. Um, uh, and if I was being critical, I'd say the problem with that is that they've just left the outdoor doors open. So actually, all they've done is move the problem in, into the building slightly. Um, really, what you want to do is everything where both sets of doors are closed so that people come in through the outer door and close it and then come in through the inner door and close it so that you're not generating a big draft of cold air that's coming in. And displacing all that expensive heated air that you've been carefully um, building up inside. Um, uh, windows and doors. I mean, actually, um, being able to um, insulate some of your windows, uh, draft proofing them often in old buildings is is as much an impact as as the um, as the insulation level of double glazing. Um, that window in the middle there. Um, that's got secondary double glazing on it. Um, I think you'd have to look twice to notice um, because it's quite sensitively done. But that's that's now a, a secondary double glazed window. 
it's not an it's not a window that needs to be opened at all so it was relatively easy in that sense to to have fixed panes of secondary glazing but the the glazing is demountable so that once a year it can be taken down and everything can be cleaned and then it can be put back up again um and and it's you know it really is quite an effective way of reducing the the heat loss through those windows um and then heating the people not the building i think this is something which is is a is a very common thing that you'll see is you've got um for, I mean, I, I mean, at the moment in the in the Castle Museum, it's, they're in a sort of temporary um, arrangement, but the reception desk is at the end of the one of the main galleries, um, which every time we go in go in there and talk to them, the, whoever's on that desk always seems to be looking pretty chilly around the edges, um, because that gallery isn't particularly well heated, and what then you get is you get people saying, well, I'm cold, so what I need is a little fan heater blowing hot air at me. Um, and then that's really, really inefficient and wasteful. Um, so the example here on the on the sort of bottom right, where the reception has been put in a nice little box of its own, which can then be kept warmer than the main gallery, um, and and uh, that means you're only heating a small space. Um, and so where you put people in buildings and what you can do in the space where the people are sitting. If you've got people working in office, they do need to be kept warmer than people that are that are in galleries um but yeah you, you need to, to think about the, the way in which you you use your space to to provide different temperatures for different uses and the the, the common thing with this particularly with heritage buildings oh we can't do anything because we're you know we're grade one listed or whatever um actually you can do things and and increasingly the conservation officers are being um much better briefed and educated about the need to to make buildings usable it always makes me laugh a bit because anything like this the, the first place you see things being done is usually on a on a like a, a cambridge college or an oxford college um so you know like i think trinity is having solar panels on its roof on a, on a grade one listed building um they're usually the ones that are quite good at getting um the, the, the concessions out of some of the some of these sort of um gatekeepers are on change um i had a case recently of a um a sort of edwardian victorian and edwardian school building um where they'd applied to put secondary double glazing in to all of the the main windows uh, and some other you know measures that were that were relatively straightforward and that had been blocked by the local conservation officer um and we we then did a review to see if the what other options there were, but really what they proposed was the right thing to do. So the only thing we could suggest is is that they actually gave notice on the building, because um, it was a council owned building, and say, well, it's not fit for purpose. We, we're going to have to find a new place for our school, and you'll have to find another use for this building because it can't be used as a school. And and unsurprisingly, that the, the, they they didn't actually have to do it. They just said they were thinking of doing it. And suddenly all of the objections disappeared and they were able to 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 fit the secondary double glazing and the various other things they wanted to do um but but again that's it, that's one of those problems where you've got a gatekeeper who has, doesn't have any responsibility for the consequences so sometimes you have to connect them to the consequences in order to to make progress and i'm sure i'm sure matthew's got some very interesting building problems on on that site but but it, every site's a bit different um so it needs imagination often to, to come up with solutions um, and often it needs persistence as well. Um, and linked into that is the is directly around inst insulation of buildings and in reducing the heat loss from buildings. Um, and I mean, this is, this is a slightly trivial example, but I think it's quite a nice one. So um, in the Cathedral Close, they, they upgraded the, um, the sort of, Little box that the 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 the, the, um, the guys that are monitoring traffic flow sit in, um, and what they what they've been installed is a fully insulated box. Um, that box for the person who sat in it, they can just open that little window and shout at the traffic passing by if they're doing the wrong thing. It needs ten watts to 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 keep it to temperature, which is hardly anything at all. Um, Whereas the one at the bottom, which is a, in a, in a, a another cathedral um, close of a cathedral that might have a slightly higher spire, but you know we, we, we're not impressed by such things. Um, if you're good at spotting cathedrals, um, 
that you know that 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 has a panel heater on that's on all the time, uh, and they don't even shut the door, so they've just got seventy watts of heat going straight to the outside world. Um, so so that that's some of the sorts of things you, you want to to look at. Um, insulation um, can be tricky in in heritage buildings. Um, but nevertheless, actually, there are things you can do. Um, and sometimes it needs a bit of imagination, as I say. Sometimes it needs some some frank exchanges of views with conservation officers. Um, but but there are, you know, there are obvious steps that can be made. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's such a common thing that I, I mean, I went I went around a, a building fairly recently, which was an Edwardian building, and they'd carefully fitted secondary double glazing to all the windows. Um, and I went up into the roof space and the ceilings were just lath and plaster onto the beams. And then above that were the tiles with daylight coming through with no insulation at all. Um, and I said to them, well, why have you not got any insulation in the in the loft? And they said, well, we just assumed there was some. So, well, did anyone go and look? You know, because <laughs> it's, it's not hard even to access it. And and they were absolutely astonished that there was no insulation in the loft, and it never even occurred to them that might that might be a, a major heat loss, um, and it is quite a big impact. So just again, a, a, being an engineer, I have to have a few graphs. So the top graph on the right that's showing you heat loss in in watts per meter squared. So basically, how much of your heat is escaping, um, and then. On the other axis along the bottom, that's the depth of loft insulation you've got. So if you've got no loft insulation at all, and you've just got the ceiling and then the roof, you've got 25 watts going out for every meter squared. This is on a, on a typical cold day. Um, if you put 100 millimeters, which is four inches in old money, which isn't much, that comes down dramatically to sort of eight-ish, seven and a half. Modern standards is for more than 300. That gets you down to to somewhere around two from 25 so it makes a massive impact and loft insulation is dead cheap um you know if if if, if you're going outside on a cold day put a hat on do the same for your building um so if you've got roof spaces that are accessible which you won't all it's worth just checking what the state of insulation is and making sure that it's it's done sally I like it when you ask questions, Sally, because I can drink my coffee. Excellent. I am just wondering, uh, in terms of depth of insulation, I've never needed to look this up recently, really. Mm. But so you're saying 300 mils of loft insulation is the current standard. But are all About a foot. loft insulations the same? I mean, if Pretty I had... Much, yeah. Are they? Yeah, uh, I mean, you can... You can spend a lot more money on fancier stuff, but but actually, the, 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 in terms of of um, you know value for money and so on, standard rock wall loft insulation is the stuff to go for. And and what you'll find is that one of the barriers often is that once you get up above about 150 mil, that's deeper than the depth of the beams, and then people have stuff in their lofts which they have on some old kitchen doors or sometimes on proper floorboards and they think, well if i'm going to put more loft insulation then then I, what am i where i'm going to put my stuff um and actually what you need to do is is you can now buy little legs to put your boarding on that raises the boarding above the beams and actually that has quite an impact because if you're just insulated between the beams the beams themselves aren't as insulating as the loft insulation once you've got another layer of another sort of Four or five inches above the beams that's really starting to to, to do some good so um but it, you know it can be difficult if you've got lots of dormer windows and you've got you know rooms in roofs and things then it's then it is more complicated so it's, it's, it's just a question of really trying to do the easy stuff on which subject um moving on to the next thing solid floors um again you know old buildings solid floors you know stone floors they're they're, they're cold and that other little graph there is showing you that if you have a bare concrete floor, that's going to be losing somewhere around 150 watts a metre. Stick a rug down with some underlay under it, and that comes down to nearly 20. 
And so if you've got, you know, if you've got people working in a, in a, a space in an old building with a solid floor, um, just putting down a, a nice rug with a big thick underlay. Um, I'm sure there's someone here that knows where you can go and buy a nice rug. Um, then that, that really does make a difference. I mean, it, it, it it, 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 you'd be surprised, basically, how, how big a difference that would make to the heat loss from that space. And similarly, hanging wall hangings. You know, there's a good reason why in medieval times they liked their tapestries, um, because they help keep the room warm. Um, and, and again, I mean, that, that slightly hard to see picture in the bottom middle is um, that that's meant to be a curtain. Um, so actually hanging curtains on not where the windows are but just on on blank stone walls um is is a really good technique and we were up in sterling recently and and looking around there i noticed that in their offices there they, they had a whole wall that was that there was a main stone wall that was completely hung with a sort of velvet big velvet curtain and unfortunately, I didn't think to take a photograph at the time. So I was then thinking, where, where can I find a photograph of a velvet curtain? That was the best I could do. Um, and it's full height wall hangings that in, in heavyweight lined material. Uh, they're breathable, so you're not, not going to have any damp issues and so on. But yeah, they do make a difference. Sally. I'm just thinking about what you just said about hanging tapestries on the wall and curtains, etc. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it the air gap that makes it work? I mean, I was just thinking, can I just stick fabric on the wall as if it were wallpaper, or does it need to have that air gap? That it, it's, it's, do? it's both. It's both the, the 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 material and the lining, and the air gap behind it. it. And and that's about making sure. That's why it's be floor to ceiling. You want to make sure that you haven't got airflow up and down it. I mean, if you think about double glazing, you've got two layers of glass and a gap. It's the gap that's doing most of the work. Um, the glass itself, it's not having two layers of glass doesn't have a very big insulating effect, but that gap of air in the middle is the thing that's doing most of the work. Or, or I mean, these days it's not air, it's it's sort of other stuff. But yeah, um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the air that's doing the work. Um, yeah. And then bottom left picture. No, nobody? I think it's drafts. 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 You've got to think about your drafts. Um, and you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can around drafts because um, I, I, I mean, I, my background is in, in other areas. I've only got into doing building stuff quite recently. And frankly, I was astonished by how much heat loss is because you've warmed the air up and then you've let it out. Um, People tend to think about drafts as being the cold air coming in, but that's not the problem. It's the warm air you're letting go, <laughs> if you see what I mean, and then having to warm up the air again. Um, so uh, drafts are, are a major source of heat loss. Hence, you know, my, my um, obsession about not having open doors, uh, keep the doors shut, put a, put a nice little sign on the outside to explain to people why the doors shut as well. You know, we were talking earlier, right at the beginning, about the role of museums in in advocacy and and so on. And if you're if you're doing things in your building and then explaining to people who are visiting why you're doing it and why it's important, then you're getting a, a double benefit there. Um, so things like draft strips to 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 look at where you're getting um, drafts coming through, keyholes. It's amazing how much air comes through a keyhole. Um, so having a having a key, keeper on a keyhole is important, um, and then things like thinking about the the air the airflow through the building. If you have a building which has got a door open both sides of it, then there's naturally going to be a pressure difference from one side of the building to the other. And if you open a door at each side, you'll get quite a lot of air pulled through. Um, and thinking about how you manage the flow of visitors so that that that's less likely to be happening. Um, and if you can having sort of little airlocks by having um, twin doors with a, with a lobby between them um, again not always easy to achieve but but that can make quite a big difference so yeah so so the, the, there's quite a lot in there but and all this really is is just trying to get your mind thinking about things you might want to go away and have a look at um, I, I obviously can't you know in the time we've got available we can't go through all the the stuff um, and then on similar topic 
Um, just to just to keep Sally on her toes. Time of use electricity. Sorry, um, Hannah, did you have a question? Yeah. Hannah. Yes, uh, we had a, we had a question on this <coughs> heat loss through um, through floors. Skated, of which mm. uh, th there's a, a layer of slabs on top of that, and I just wondered what the sort of heat transfer coefficient was like on a, on on um, on the bitumen itself, because it, it obviously is very dry because it acts as a damp proof course, but I've never been too sure as to whether it gives much sort of uh, protection to heat loss through the floor. That that would be um, a good follow up question. If you wanted to to send that in. Um, for the cafe, because I can go away and look that up. I'm sure that the, yeah. the SIBSI guides produces some information on that because um, it, it's such a common building material, um, maybe more in roofs than in floors. But but I'm I'm sure there's a there'll be a number for it, and I could I could give you some information on that. I I think you're maybe right. I suspect it's probably quite good. Yes. Okay, time's time's getting on a bit. Um, so just trundling through the last bit. Time of use of electricity. This is really just to to make the point that um, during a day, typically the electricity carbon content moves around a lot, and sophisticated organisations who can do are looking at ways in which they can use electricity off peak. So typically, if you're looking at having electric electrified your heating, then one of the things you can do is you can use a big heat store and you run the heat to pump up the heat store overnight on on low carbon low cost electricity and then you use the heat during the day it's like the sort of modern equivalent of the old night storage heaters um so that's that's the thing again there's a, there's something you can you can have a think about there but um that really comes into the next stage of, of decarbonization and then we're really coming on to the, the sort of big money ticket items um so very quickly because we're, we're we're up against time now it's going to rattle through much more quickly in the second half um changing to electrified heat so you'll be aware of all the moves to move to heat pumps the point about a heat pump is that even if as we said earlier the carbon content of electricity is currently still not very different from gas the big difference is with a heat pump, you get three or four times the heat out of it, of the electricity you put in. Um, because what you're doing is instead of actually just generating heat, you're actually using the energy to pump the heat from the outside to the inside in just the same way that a fridge pumps the, the heat from the inside of the fridge out into the room. It's the same technology. Um, so at the moment, though, because gas is so cheap relative to electricity, if you're on gas, moving to heat pumps is probably not going to save you any, anything in terms of running costs. They are looking to change that. The government were meant to have been doing um, some work on that, but they seem to have been a bit distracted by some other issues. Uh, you, know, I, you, you won't have seen much in the news about rebalancing gas and electricity prices. Um, just as a, a general point, biomass as a solution for heat, which was very fashionable 10 years ago, gener generally now is not actually considered to be genuinely carbon free. Um, unless you know, you've got your own source of woodland and you're going to manage your own supply, um, it's, it's slightly dubious. The, the, um, the, 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 the whole business of supply and wood chip has become uh, a bit controversial because it's not necessarily fully sustainable. Um, and um, heat pumps, as I say, they're just pumping the heat from from the outside to the inside. They don't they don't break the second law of thermodynamics for any Flanders and Swan fans out there. You, know, you can actually pass heat from the cooler to the hotter if you do it through the correct thermodynamic cycle. And generally speaking, um, it's either coming from the air with an air source heat pump, or you can pump it out of the ground using boreholes or buried pipes. Um, Air source is, is much cheaper to implement, um, but often there's issues around space and they're less efficient. So they cost a bit more to run than ground source. Um, and 
that that's a whole separate subject of a, would there be a whole subject of another session really to talk um, in detail about heat decarbonisation. Um, I've put a, a slide in that you can have a look at later that just explains a little bit. You may have heard people talking about the fact that heat pumps are only any good for, for low temperatures. Um, that's really not really true. If you can use lower temperature heat, the heat pump will be more efficient for a standard heat pump. Um, so if you can, I mean, a lot of old buildings actually having air to air heat pumps is quite a good idea because only heat in the air rather than the building space. Um, and they can be very efficient because they're, they're just generating a relatively small temperature rise. Um, but the world is changing. So, so there's a new generation of heat pumps that can generate hot, high temperature heat for, for, to, for existing radiators quite efficiently. And they just use a different thermodynamic cycle and a different working fluid. Um, and you can get very neat little units which have a heat pump for generating hot water that will generate hot water at 70, 70 degrees. Um, that, that, are, that are very effective. So, so the, it's an evolving um, space. Um, the difficulty often is to get independent advice. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that can be an issue. And as I say, at the moment, gas is very cheap relative to electricity. So, um, if you if you're going to switch from gas to a to a uh, you know a sort of a low temperature heat pump. You, you're not going to save much money, maybe a little bit. And also, this is slightly out of date because cost per unit have have, have um, shifted a lot, um, and and uh, it's very difficult to forecast what energy is going to do. Um, that's that's again a, one of the sort of bane's of my life is trying to say to people, well, well, how do you how are we going to predict what the relative cost of electricity and gas is going to be for the next fifty years? Um, and and you see. Um, projects that that um, come to the wrong conclusions because they took a spot view of, of of what the cost of electricity was. So there are projects that didn't get the go ahead two years ago because electricity was too cheap. That are probably now regretting they didn't do it at, at where electricity is now. So uh, that that can be quite tricky. And then really the final thing on this is on generating your own electricity. Um, if you have an opportunity, if you've got the space for solar, then it just pays for itself. It's it's very straightforward. Even if you've only just got a car park to put solar on, um, then that pays for itself with electricity prices where they are. So at the bottom of this page, just as, as a rough guidance, if you were to install some solar pa panels um, and you borrowed the money to do it, so you're not even going to find the, the, the capital from, from your own resources. You're just going to go out and borrow it. Um, then on, on a sort of typical basis, somewhere between 8.5p and 10p a unit is what the, the, the cost of that electricity equivalent would be. So that's, as you can see, that's way cheaper than, than what you're buying. Um, so, so often you can actually finance um, a, a scheme like this and the savings more than are enough to cover the, the the finance, and you're saving money on top as well as being low carbon. Um, so well well worth having a look at. Again, there are complications around getting the um, the grid to allow you to do it. If 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 you're in an area where there's poor connectivity, um, that can be an issue. Generally speaking, you only want to install enough to 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 make sure you use most of it, um, because if you don't. Then, then it's less valuable if you if you can't use it and you're just selling it back to the grid. You don't earn so much from it. But again, that's that's another quite big topic around that. And that may be something if you've got specific questions to bring to the to the cafe, or for me to follow up with you on a sort of one to one following this session. So that's really really coming to the end. So you know we want to measure what you're doing, prioritize, and um, and and get on an act and you should then be able to um, uh, you know, be on the right path um, and it might need you know thinking about making allowances for, for capital um, don't don't one of the things not to do is just is to spend two years going away and thinking about a plan before you start uh, the thing to do is to, is to quickly identify where the quick wins are get on and do those and in parallel with that develop your plan and develop the way you're going to track against that plan um, and get yourself onto this this sort of improvement cycle 
of, of measuring what you're doing, working out what's worked, what hasn't, and 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 acting on that. Um, and I, I mean, just as another incentive that this is worth doing, of course, increasingly funding bodies are expecting organisations to be doing this, and they'll be looking for you to be able to um, talk about that in funding bids, and and that will definitely be a a worthwhile thing to be able to do. Um, I think these slides are going to be made available, aren't they, Alex? Um, because yeah, we're going to have the, the recording available. Um, because also I've got a bunch of links here which should be useful to circulate, which are just examples of other people and what they've done and and um, some good ideas. Um, and Henry McGee's book about um, museums and sustainable development goals has got some some practical information in it as well. Um, so I'm afraid I've run over by by uh, six minutes, but I'm happy to, to carry on with, with any questions if you're able to, to stay on to ask them or come along to the cafe. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, no, I can say Philip does. Yeah, yeah but I've got one. I, one of the things we've heard mentioned about solar panels is that there's a, a fair degree of maintenance uh, required each year. And obviously the access on a roof is not always all that easy. Uh, mm. But I wondered if you've got any comments on this question of sort of maintenance and what, what sort of things you have to do to r retain the panels in a, a sort of working order. I mean, generally speaking, the maintenance on, on solar is, is very light. Um, basically it's keeping them clean um and the modern generation of panels um are relatively self-cleaning anyway but if you're in an area where there's there's a lot of, of pollution we we did a project where we put a whole lot of solar panels on chicken sheds um and no one had tweaked the fact that the ventilation outlets from the chicken shed come out just at the top of the roof ridge above the panels um and within a you know a few weeks of them being on there they were covered in a thick layer of, of, of nice chickeny dust so so yes you do need to keep them clean um, but for for most places, you put them up and you forget about it, and and you you might find that after you know ten years, you 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 have an issue with your electronics that needs to be replaced um, because those those bits don't last as long as the panels. Um, but there are there are people who have had solar on their roofs for over twenty years and they're still going strong with that without any real issues at all. The, the other thing on, on the solar panels is we're a, a grade two listed building. And uh, I always got the impression that it was very difficult to get um, uh, uh, building um, consent for that. But I, I noticed you mentioned the King's College Cambridge situation. And we've also got a situation yeah. within the parish of, uh, of with Sir Peter Mancroft where apparently yep. they've got approval from listed buildings to go ahead and install uh, solar panels, I think starting yep. early next year sometime. That, that's that's correct, yes. And that's, and that's on the basis of visibility. So the St. Peter Mancroft ones are effectively on a, on a side roof behind a parapet. Yeah. Um, so that the argument, the, the persuasion was that that you know there was there was no issue of visibility. Um, yes. I, well, think I think for your building... Yeah, that that sure. may may be that you can you could you could argue that as well that they wouldn't be highly visible. Well, I think they um, would be in a way because the the roof area where they go on to is 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 south facing, which is obviously ideal. True, that is that is the front face of the building. Um, but it is but actually the building from an architectural point of view is the the main interest is inside, not on the exactly outside. Exactly. So your your yeah. listing presumably is your is the internal structure of your roof and the and yes. the floor and so on. So. That that may also make it easier, um, but yes. again, you would need to think structurally about your roof and the roof access, um, and that that you probably need to to pay for a structural survey um, for for the roof, which is an added cost up front. Yes, um, I, I well, yes, I think the roof itself. Uh, our main concern was on the maintenance side, whereas you know it, it's you you have to get. Uh, there's some subsidiary roof areas that lead yep. on to the main roof area and yep. uh, 
um, you know, that, that could make sort of maintenance difficult because you'd have to get yeah. sort of access to, to, to the roof. But I mean, I presume you could but, use but something only... like one of these. Uh, so, so the, yeah, the only maintenance really is is cleaning, which they do with the same way they do, you know, window cleaning on tall buildings with these long extending oh, see, yes. pipes and things. So, so you wouldn't never, you'd never really go back on the roof, um, on on those no. systems. And it's perfectly normal to fit solar panels on a roof where where access is difficult, and you're on the basis you're never going to go back up there again. I see. Yeah, I think the other thing we were Con concerned about what, what what we felt was that apparently whereas there was resistance in the past to granting permission uh, because it's a sort of indication of being sort of uh, socially aware and uh, environmentally aware that actually seeing the panels now no longer sort of uh, create the same degree of horror that uh, probably existed in the past but i don't know whether that's a, a logical but that, that argument that one probably is a good argument for a planning committee but i'm not sure that it, it it has much influence on the the dark heart of a conservation officer no i wondered that myself yeah, yeah. yes but with a grade two but otherwise, that really shouldn't be an issue if you were two star and if, if it was your exterior that was the the listing that more likely to yeah. be an issue but, but it's worth a conversation because you'll probably find it isn't an issue yeah, because our, our cost outside... of going through planning. No, yeah, I think on the our external view of the building is more like a railway shed than a. It looks a bit. Anyway, thanks very much. And um, Matthew's put a question in about having very limited car parking, um, and that can't be increased. But I'd like to offer electric car charging. And he said, is it worth losing the space to have the charges installed? Yes, I mean, you, you wouldn't need to lose any parking space to put charges in. And for, um, you know, for, for a facility like yours, you'd only be putting in a seven and a half kilowatt charger because um, people will come and they'll park and they'll be there, you'd hope, for several hours because there's a lot to see. So... From that point of view, you, you don't need to be offering people, you know, super whizzy fast chargers. Um, they can just be seven and a half kilowatt units. And depending on the cost of, of setting up the connection, because you need to supply the electricity to the space, um, it would generally be much better to have three or four seven and a half kilowatt chargers than 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 one big one, um, because then people can can come and park in the space, plug in all the time they're at the museum. If you've got one faster charger, then you need to manage its use somehow to make sure it isn't blocked by people that have parked there and then disappeared into the museum and are fully charged but still blocking the space and so on. Um, but yeah, so 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 off offering people the opportunity to charge can be a way of of helping attract people in, um, and it doesn't need to be a, a complicated thing. It's it's a relatively straightforward electrical um, issue. paper. That. Sorry, I don't think we said. Philip was just asking how would customers Sorry, pay for Sorry, say that their... again. Uh, how would how would the um, customers well, pay for this? Where... Um, you yeah. you can. There's two ways. You can either just basically host a charging unit that a commercial entity will provide. They'll manage it. They take the charges, um, and they'll pay you for the electricity it uses. Um, or the other thing which actually I've seen which works really well is you simply, if you park in the electric car space, you have to pay for your parking and you have to pay a premium. Um, and that also encourages people not to stay parked in there longer than they have to. So you just do it on time. And you, you just say to people, if you're parked in the electric bay, you need to get a, a, you know, a, a, a ticket from, the, from reception to stick in your window. And then we will charge you X pence per hour that you're parked there. Just and we just make a note of the time you 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 take the the um the ticket out and when you bring it back that's the end of the time and then you pay us and you just you just do it by time time is really easy to measure much easier to measure yeah. than electricity uh, yeah and if you do that then you don't have to worry about having an expensive unit that's got metering in it or payment facilities or all of that and mm. it's a huge difference I mean it's it's probably something like seven hundred pounds for a basic charging unit. And you're talking several thousand pounds as soon as you want to add any form of way of collecting payment. Um, 
so yeah but yeah. Yeah, charging for the time is, is cheap and easy Um, right, we're starting to shed people as they have to kind of move on. So I think we'll probably... Yes, to go, yes. Apologies, I overran in the second half. Um, any other questions um, you can think of and over kind of Christmas, the next few weeks, um, do email them in to the Share Museum's email address, which you'll find obviously on the website if you don't already have it. And we will um, pass those on to John. So if you could try and get them in kind of... Um, a few days at least before the um, Q&A session on the 10th of January. That would be great and give John time to review them and um, and kind of consider his replies. Um, if you'd like to come to the Q&A session on the 10th, would you mind booking it on Eventbrite, please? Um, that would be great. And also I'll circulate that round. Um, this recording will be available on the YouTube channel, probably this afternoon. Again, I will circulate that around. Um, there are more events planned for the new year. They're in the Eventbrite diary. If you want to help calculating your museum's carbon footprint, that is our next long session. And we're going to be looking at, John's going to be looking at kind of the three main free calculators on the internet and how to use them and kind of give museums a bit of a head start in trying to calculate what their footprint is so then you can set yourself a carbon budget. Um, evaluation forms obviously will come out so if you could get those back to me that would be brilliant and apologies for finishing just a little bit late but it was all really useful information. So thanks very much John that was great and really interesting and thank you everyone who is still here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you, John. Bye, Sally. Thanks, Becky. I had a question in the chat, and I was trying to be good and not talk anymore. Yeah, I couldn't see the, the chat. My question in the chat was: You twice mentioned that you need independent advice.